and we were making so much more money on this small channel than we'd ever made on the big 2 million subscriber channel. So what it really comes down to is becoming the go-to person in a niche that has growing demand and that has good product market fit. Instead of looking at people who are doing the same kind of content you're doing and trying to pull a lot of inspiration from them, look at somebody who's in another niche that you're interested in and ask yourself like, how can I pull a little bit of what they're doing and bring it over here? Because that's where you get like the whole steal like an artist ethos, right? Is it possible to earn over a million dollars a year from a small channel? Well, today on the Think Media Podcast, I'm talking with Thomas Frank, who actually left his over 2 million subscriber channel to start a new channel that generated over $1.4 million in just a year. And in this episode, he's gonna be breaking down what he did, some tips from that lesson. And in general, he's a genius when it comes to productivity, mindset, personal development. So this should be a powerful episode that you're definitely gonna to wanna to stick around until the end for. But Thomas, how's it going? It is going very well. Super pumped to be hanging out with you. And uh, as we get into some tactics heavy information, uh, for those that are maybe just meeting you, give a little bit of context to your history. Yeah, so I'll wait to this camera, but I'm gonna talk to you for the most part. Uh, I started making YouTube content 2014, mostly for college students. Uh, before that, I was a blogger making blog posts and podcasts for college students, basically how to study better, how to be more productive, how to get your uh, first job out of college, that kind of thing. Moved on to general productivity for professionals as I got older, and then uh, started dinking around with Notion in 2018. And for those of you who don't know, Notion is productivity software that is very, very customizable. You can kind of do whatever you want with it, which means that it has a very high learning curve. And in 2020, I realized there's enough of a learning curve in this, and there's enough of an audience building up around it that I think there's an appetite for a channel around it. So in 2020, I started making uh, Notion tutorials. I made a whole separate channel called Thomas Frank Explains. Uh, as a side project, partly because I was burned out from the main channel and partly because I was just having so much fun. And then 2021 rolled around, I made some products and that is basically what I spend all my time doing now is making Notion tutorials, products in the ecosystem, templates, automations, that kind of thing. That's amazing. Was it hard to let go of a channel that grew to 2 million subscribers? I mean, it's still there. It probably still bringing in some <laughs> revenue from videos yeah. that are still being watched, but you haven't uploaded in a year. Was that hard decision Been to make? about a year and six months since I uploaded. Uh, and, and the funny thing is I didn't make the decision to abandon the channel. Uh, it just sort of happened. So I launched a product last year and my intention was, okay, I'm gonna take a, a month off of the main channel to build the product. I'm gonna release it and then I'm gonna get right back to making main channel videos. Well, I built the product in a month, released it, and it instantly started making about 90 grand a month. And I had no support staff. And one of the things I really wanted to offer was uh, dedicated active support for my customers. So I spent about six to eight weeks doing full-time support in our support forum myself. And that was yet another month or two not publishing. And then I hired a team to do support and I spent another month onboarding them. And then I just went through all these different little projects and we were making so much more money on this small channel than we'd ever made on the big 2 million subscriber channel. Meanwhile, I'm having more fun than ever because this is perfectly aligned with my nerdy tech brain. So it's just like a, okay, we'll get to the main channel next month. We'll get to the main channel next month. And we're finally to a point where next month we actually will get to the main channel. I've hired people to help me with scripts and I've hired people to help me with editing. So we're getting back to that machine. So I'm gonna call it a side quest not an abandoning of the main thing and a switching over permanently. So your main channel will actually become your side quest. Uh, I think so, yes. And then <laughs> the this, side quest becomes the main quest and vice versa. That's amazing. And it's that speaks to just how exciting the creator economy can be and mm -hmm. how much longevity. That's inspiring that you've been in the creator economy for a long time. And so to be clear on the product you launched, like what's the website for the product? ThomasJFrank.com. And, and then you can just go to Notion templates at the top and you'll find the products. And is it, so it's multiple different templates. Yes. And an aggregate together, they're digital products. Mm-hmm that plug into Notion? Uh, yeah, they're basically Notion pages I share. So Notion starts as a blank canvas. Um, there are some templates that they have which are very basic, but if you want something a bit more advanced, like say you're a creator with a team and you want a full pipeline from ideation of your content to having an archive where you can analyze performance, go back in, see your scripts, all that kind of stuff, we turn that into a product. Similarly, we turned uh, my, my want for an all-in-one productivity system into a product as well. And what are the price ranges of these? Uh, Ultimate Brain right now is 129, and then Creators Companion, the highest end is 199, and then we have a bundle, which is 229. To get everything? Yep, so that and is the highest ticket product we sell. What is the 
general revenue range monthly now? Right now, between like 110 and 145 per month. And how do you market it? Just YouTube organic? Just YouTube organic. And I guess SEO, if you want to say that as well. Um, so a blog. for Yes. For most Notion tutorial videos, I will also try to create a written resource. And then um, beyond the videos, we've also created some bigger resources. So one thing Notion really never did was made uh, like a full-on documentation site for their formulas feature, which is very similar to Excel formulas. So kind of complicated to learn. I spent four months writing full-on developer style documentation for that as well. So we get a lot of site traffic and uh, and then mostly YouTube traffic as well. And do you, how big is your team for the Notion side of things become? That's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't say that we have like a clear separation between the notion side and the other side like my editor tony especially has the biggest overlap between the two because he'll work on all the videos uh but the team is 10 people now do you write your own blogs or do you have a writer for like the blogs i write my own blogs at this point okay so you write your own blogs that have done the seo uh yes you come up with the video content uh yep on the notion side what yes. are the roles of the team so we have two full-time support people. We have an ops director and she is amazing. Her name is Marissa. Um, and Tony is our editor and then he also is in the studio with me. So he'll also help with camera operation. He even helps with some uh, ideation for video topics. And when you get to 10 people, it's hard to think of everyone on the team. Sure. Um, one other person, uh, Eli, is our full-time developer on a software product that we are launching hopefully next month. So don't have a ton of details on that I can share quite yet. But yeah, quite a few different things going on. And what have you learned about building a team? Was that hard? Did that come natural? Uh, no, it was hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the main thing that I can say I've learned and which I think will be helpful for certain viewers is uh, I am not built to be a manager and it is possible to build a team without having to become a manager. So I am I'm an explorer. Um, I'm a builder. I want to learn and build things all day long and teach people. I do not want to spend any time giving feedback, uh, doing performance reports, any of that kind of thing. Management is just not in my DNA. So what I've learned is to get to the point where you have a team, you kind of do have to go on a, yet another little side quest, learn how to manage uh, a small team. But once you get to a certain size, you can hire an ops director, you can hire a COO, you can even hire a CEO if you need to. And they can handle the business aspects for you while you still stick in the creative lanes if you want to. That's uh, really great advice. So on this topic of how do I make a million dollars a year from a small channel, for someone listening to this, what are some of the steps or tips that you would try to apply in a more general sense to creators? What it really comes down to is becoming the go-to person in a niche that has growing demand and that has good product market fit. So what we've done, and I'll use what we've done as an example, because I don't want to try to generalize my advice too much, but what we've done is we, we realized that I had an interest in Notion, I had skill and a lot of product knowledge there, and there was a large and growing contingent of people who were very interested in it, and there was, uh, there was products that we could build that people actually wanted to buy. So what that created was a very strong funnel. And I think that's what a lot of creators don't quite understand. They think if I get a lot of views, that's going to somehow lead to money. But that's like pouring water at the edge of a funnel that's just been cut off right at the, the, the top slice, right? It's gonna go nowhere. It's not gonna go into the bottle you want it to go into. So you have to figure out how do you get people from the top part of your funnel to the bottom part of your funnel. And if there are strong transitional points to each, each stage in the funnel, that is how you build a sustainable business. So in our case, there's a lot of interest around Notion right now, which means that we can get quite a lot of traffic on videos in a niche sense, it's not Mr. Beast level. It's not even uh, not even like 100K per video most times, but it's enough people who are interested enough in this product and are interested enough in our products who may pay $129 or uh, $79 if we're running a sale, that kind of thing, that you don't have to have a huge audience. You just have to have enough that come in and buy at that level. So right now we operate on, I believe like a $90 average order value. Uh, you could do the math in your head right now. It doesn't take a lot of sales to get to hundred grand per month relatively uh, when you're at $90 average per value. Uh, versus with something like AdSense, most people are getting between, uh, what is it like one and $4 CPA is the, the average that gets thrown on in the industry. That's a lot of people you have to bring in to make any kind of money at all. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, I think for the YouTube mindset um, is focused on I have to go viral to make this sustainable. Mm -hmm. And what's also interesting, was it at all a struggle for you to have that view differential? I think for some, if you don't have a big visible view count, which could be arguably a vanity metric, it could hurt your ego. 
it can make you feel like you're not successful as a YouTuber. You're not getting Mr. Beast numbers. Even the lid or like the height of your content won't compare to your other channels numbers. It's not as much broad appeal. Right. But it's such a it's a much more effective business. But was that just easy for you because you saw behind the scenes or was there any kind of ego of like, well, I'm not pulling <laughs> your, your most viewed video as six plus million views or seven. Right. And you're you're not pulling those numbers, but it's such a niche thing. Was mm -hmm. it an easy transition for you, or is there anything? I'll say there's a slight bit of ego. Yeah. But I think that I kind of worked through those ego problems before I even went full time on Thomas Frank Explains. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is I had been in the productivity niche for so long, I was kind of at the top of it for a while, and then Matt Diavella came along, Better Ideas came along, Ali Abdal came along, and even before they all passed me up, I could tell like they're going to pass me up. They're either hungrier or they make better content in certain dimensions or they're publishing more often. Like I can see the trajectory and I can either chase that hamster wheel because I want to satisfy my ego and stay on top. Or I can really dig deep and say like, what is it that I actually want to do? What What is the average day that I want to experience? What are the metrics that actually matter? I don't necessarily want to be a famous person. I don't want to be mobbed when I go to a place like this. Mm -hmm. um, so chasing the fame is actually counterintuitive to what I want. There's like that Bill Murray story where he's like, I always tell people who want to be rich and famous, try being rich first, see if that covers all the bases. Uh, and I've, I've definitely realized that like, as I've become a little bit less known, generally, I'm actually happier. Mm. I can go more places, not get recognized. I can spend more time on the highly technical niche things that actually interest me. And there's an audience there that is so hungry for that kind of content as well. I can have a sustainable career without needing to chase the big numbers. So at this point, I'm just like, I don't really care. Yeah. As long as I can sustain myself and especially my team and my family, I'm good to go. Are you ready to start or grow your YouTube channel? Do you feel stuck and need help connecting the dots? Join this free web class where you'll learn the step-by-step -step playbook for YouTube success. We've helped thousands of purpose-driven entrepreneurs just like you grow their influence with video. Register today for this exclusive training at thinkmasterclass.com. That's, it's actually, you're like a Think Media podcast dream guest because <laughs> we actually, our dream is to help creators reach financial independence and maybe be unknown in the process mm -hmm. uh, because everyone's chasing fame and I think fame could be overrated. Yes. Uh, some, will, some will reach that and maybe that's the model that most aligns with even the style of content and perhaps it could be their desire. It could be a toxic desire, but it also could be a good desire if mm -hmm. you want to reach and impact a lot of people. But saying that, it's so encouraging that it's possible to make, man, over a million dollars a year and beyond with a small channel. Are you focused completely on YouTube or are you trying to diversify into vertical video across platforms? Right now, YouTube, uh, it's, it's the thing where I would like to be diversifying on the TikTok, onto YouTube shorts, all that kind of stuff. But it comes down to what's my capacity for creating content right now. If I could someday scale the team to where they can hand me um, you know, a script or something and it's like, here's five shorts you're gonna film, I'm totally down to do that. Right now, my average day is I come into the office and I spend the entire day programming because mm -hmm. I've been working on the same video for two months. And uh, <laughs> I, I think I think in lumpy analytic terms. So like everyone wants the, to have that smooth hockey stick style curve and they think you need to have super, super frequent content to do that. Um, I'm okay with like a little jump and then plateau for a while, a little jump, a little plateau for a while because during those plateaus, you have some breathing room and some time to sort of go into the cave Tony Stark style and build something out of a box of scraps. And then you get to go stand on the stage and present what you've built. Mm. So that's the kind of style that really resonates with me. If I could build the machine around me that would allow me to also create content that's in short form video uh, form without really digging into that schedule, I'm down for it. And you think that now going back to your other channel, how is that gonna be sustainable? Because you have someone helping you with scripting? Two people helping with scripting, got my editor, so by necessity, the main channel is going to have to become, or I guess my role in the main channel is going to have to become more like, um, say, a Hank Green on Crash Course, where he's not necessarily the one writing the chemistry scripts. He's got a script supervisor, uh, he has writers, he has fact checkers, and he has a whole editing and post-production team. He can sit down, maybe do a table read for the script, get familiar with the material, make sure he's into it, deliver it to the camera, and make a good show. You become a host, almost. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's actually where the ego problem lies. It's not in the views or the fame. It's like this internal feeling like I should be part of every step of the process in every video I make, otherwise it's somehow bad. And I've realized watching other people's shows that I really enjoy, no, it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. 
So a really good friend of mine once said like, uh, get clear on what is your ego and what is your art. So like, what's the real core of what you contribute and what you're best at? And what's just the stuff that your ego says you have to do and cut out that ego stuff. That's really powerful. I think Phil DeFranco has a similar show and he's also been sustainable. He has writers. Yes. He's delivering the news. Mm -hmm. He can weave in his personality, maybe veer off script, of mm -hmm. course. And it's always his personality, but he's also created the machine. But that's some very powerful insights for us to think of maybe a little bit different about the trajectory of where our content will go. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do a little bit of a lightning round with you related to maybe books, podcasts, influential resources as someone that is into productivity and all of the above um, that have helped you in your journey, maybe just personal development in general. Mm -hmm. um, what is some of the top books or audiobooks that you think creators should read? It could be related to being a better creator um, and it may be also just having better habits, being more effective and yeah. actually getting things done. Do you think that the average person watching this is maybe in the beginning stages? Um, we have the average person watching this could just be starting, but we do have a lot of seasoned creators that are pretty established and a ton of business owners that either want to build a personal brand or use YouTube to get more leads, clients, and sales. So leverage kind of their personal brand, but to grow their business. So there's some diversity here, but a lot of Think Media is a little bit more advanced as well. Gotcha. I think a lot of the consumption I did of books and podcasts and things were much more at the beginning stages. So I'll give a, a couple of recommendations there. The main one for me is a little book, like truly little, uh, called The Motivation Hacker. And this was a book that this guy Nick Winter wrote when he was, I think like 22 or 23 years old. And it was just like, it's a book about how he forced himself to do a bunch of goals he had. Uh, and I read that back in 2013 when I had hit a point in my blog where I actually got like that mythical passive income. Like I was literally getting like five to seven grand a month and I didn't have to do anything for it. I had written a post that ranked number one on Google for a high value keyword. And then the rest of my blog was about nothing. Like it wasn't about that at all. So people just kept coming in and I'm like, cool, I'm living with my college roommates making seven grand a month. I can basically do what I want. So for a year, I just played Magic the Gathering and like tried to get myself to work. I read this book, he's like, I went through this exact same problem. So what I did is I signed up for this tool that makes you bet money that you're gonna do what you said you were gonna do. And if I didn't write my 500 words a day, I was gonna lose like $7,000. Wow. And so I used that tool, it was called Beeminder. I didn't bet $7,000. I kind of just put more of my ego and like five bucks on the line, but it transformed my work style. It was like that, uh, that mindset shift from amateur to professional. Professionals show up, they don't wait for inspiration. They come in and they practice the craft every single day and they dig inspiration out of the ground. So I would recommend reading that book if people have troubles with consistency. I would also recommend another very tiny book called The Dip by Seth Godin. Uh, this was a very inspiring book for my transition from a big YouTuber doing productivity style content to the niche content. That book is about how to quit strategically and how to know when to quit. And um, it's like, you can read it in an hour. So. I don't really need to get a huge synopsis of it. I recommend everyone read it to identify at what point in my journey am I, am I now trying to exploit something that is no longer exploitable? Am I trying to draw blood from a stone? And what point in my journey do I need to go explore and do something else? Of course, we'll link those up in the show notes. Mm -hmm. As far as a like content creator in terms of storytelling or structure, has there been any films or creators or documentaries that have maybe helped you create content better, be a better artist? I'm very inspired by Edgar Wright films. So Scott Pilgrim, Hot Fuzz, those kinds of ones. Um, it's hard to say because I really try to pull my inspiration from a huge variety of sources. I'll give you a great example. I got into this game doing academic success content. There was nobody on YouTube at the time doing it well. So my original inspiration came from Crash Course and they were doing like Crash Course World History 2 and Biology at the time, I wanna say. Uh, and then there were people doing like video game retrospective videos. So people like Cat Icarus and Satchel Drakes and uh, John Tron back in the day. That's where I pulled a lot of my style inspiration from in the beginning. And I just was like, how can I apply this to my specific niche? So I would say instead of, and I think this is actually quite important to say, instead of looking at people who are doing the same kind of content you're doing and trying to pull a lot of inspiration from them, I think that's how we get beast clones. Look at somebody who's in another niche that you're interested in and ask yourself, like, how can I pull a little bit of what they're doing and bring it over here? Because that's where you get like the whole steal like an artist ethos, right? You're pulling something from a totally unrelated niche. You're bringing it to your own and you're making your own niche better without really copying. Yeah. And for that reference, still like an artist, another great book, Austin Cleon. Mm -hmm. Also show your work. All his books are very cool. And uh, there's going to be uh, a resource rich 
episode in the description. Are you a podcast consumer? Not anymore. <laughs> but you were previously? Was yeah, I was any, back in the day. Any helpful business or entrepreneur podcast that helped you build your business? Um, so there's a new podcast. So I used to I used to co-host a podcast called Listen to Money Matters, which is a personal finance show. It was my favorite podcast in college. One of the co-hosts left. I basically took his spot. So it was your favorite podcast as a listener? Yes. And then you eventually were a host on it? Yeah. So basically the way this worked is I had my podcast, the College Info Geek podcast. I really wanted to have an episode about personal finance. So I went on iTunes. I found a great personal finance show, emailed the guys. We instantly hit it off. We become friends. And then every single morning I would listen to their show because they were daily back then. Yeah. They had a bit of a falling out. One of the co-hosts left. I was like, I don't want this show to die can I just come take the spot? That's wild. And so uh, Andrew and I co-hosted that show for three years. I eventually left and then the original co-host came back and they also co-hosted a show called Money Lab, which it is done, it's still online. I recommend going through the archives. Uh, but Andrew recently started a new show called Seeking Profit. So if you're interested in online business, that is the current show that I listen to on occasion when I do listen to podcasts. So it's called Seeking Profit yep. Podcast. So we'll link that one up as well. And... Was that remote for you? Were you able to be a co-host on this podcast mm -hmm. just remotely? Yep. And it was audio only? Yeah, it was audio only. Um, and they do theirs video now, but they're also remote. I mean, yeah. Riverside FM is just such a good tool. You can build a whole remote show and you can have yeah. camera angles. You know, with like a Riverside and a good Blackmagic setup, you can basically do anything. Yeah. That, yeah. We StreamYard does something similar. That's what we use. Mm. Kind of They call it perfect record. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it's really crispy on the back end, captures natively on people's computers and then uploads to the cloud before mm -hmm. they jump off similar. And uh, yeah, video podcasts, big opportunity because you could kind of live anywhere. Yes. And uh, still create great content. As long as you got internet. 100%. Well, as we're landing the plane, um, is it too late to start YouTube? No. <laughs> Why do you say it, that? Because the audience keeps growing. And when the audience grows, the micro niches grow too. Uh, so my favorite example of this is my friend Patch from Tier Zoo. His channel does like fighting game style tier rankings of animals. And so like that's a niche where you're like taking fighting games and video game culture and then zoology and mashing that together. And he has a multi-million subscriber channel now. Every single video gets over a million views. That's a niche he invented, right? And now here I am making, uh, you know, a million dollars a year. It feels like a brag, but like it's about productivity software. Yeah. And you go look at people who are doing content on Obsidian, which is even smaller, like they're building sustainable businesses. So... YouTube's audience is always expanding. And I think that as a community, we're now learning more and more and really dialing in on what it takes to build a great channel on how to optimize for attention, all this kind of stuff. There's more resources out there than ever. The uh, cost to entry is lower than ever and the audience is bigger than ever. So while the competition is uh, both more numerous and higher skilled, your barriers are lower. There's more people out there. It's worth trying. And I think it's easier than ever to succeed, ironically. Final two questions because of your unique perspective as a guest. Two different types of listeners to this podcast. The first is trying to break six figures. The second is trying to break seven figures. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for that person that is as a creator or entrepreneur? So they're maybe creating content. They also are trying to do a digital product. Maybe they're going Patreon, uh, more entertainment brand deals. But they're trying to scale up. Any tips for the barrier of six figures? I feel like the answer is kind of the same for six and seven. Yeah. Uh, so the, the answer is to optimize for more of you. And what I mean by that is most creators are looking at how do I increase my AdSense revenue through more views or how do I get sponsorships and brand deals? Those are both great ways to monetize. Uh, I hit six figures quite easily with sponsorships and brand deals. But when people click on a video of yours, they're signaling that they want something, they want to watch the video. So the video has a job to be done, which is deliver what it promises to the viewer. If you slot in a sponsorship or if you do a mid-roll ad, that kind of harms the video's job, right? Because the person didn't click on the video to see an ad for an away suitcase or a Skillshare or whatever it is, and you know, those are great products, but that's not, not what they came there for. If someone clicks on one of my videos because they wanna build a uh, full stack creator management system in Notion, that's what they want. And if I have a product that I can sell them, I'm like, hey, I can teach you how to build this, you can do it for free, or I can set it up for you, save you tons of time, we have a support, that pipeline is just so obvious. So if you can optimize for more of the thing your audience came in for and you can productize that, that is the quickest way to six figures and I think seven figures as well. Specific to the question of second, seven figures, 
I know some people who have done this without scaling, but it's easier if you scale and bring on extra people who can take off all of the things that you are not the best at. So if you can bring in an ops person, uh, if you can bring in an editor, I think editor is the number one hire everyone should make. First thing they should do is hire an editor. If you can get a VA to handle support or handle um, like customer requests or your email or whatever it is, you have more time to focus on your content and you have more time to focus on your product offerings. And that is what is going to help you get to that six and seven, a seven figure uh, benchmark. Uh, I know Alex Ramazzi had a great tweet about this. He said, you don't get rich by diversifying, you get rich by focusing and then you stay rich by diversifying. So if you can just batten down the hatches, focus on whatever is the highest leverage activity you have access to, that's the quickest way to get there. You're a legend, super grateful for all the wisdom you've shared today. This is a very rich, strategic, and powerful podcast. So thank you, Thomas. People, of course, can check out everything that you're doing in the show notes. Lots of good resources shared. But break it down if people want to follow you on social media and then your main, or both channels, because mm -hmm. uh, by the time they see this too, we'll be uh, blessed to have content on both channels. Where can people connect with you? Yeah, so um, the audience here is creators. The main thing that I'll share is on my website, thomasjfrank.com. You can go to the little blog tab and there's a creator advice section. That's just an area where I've been brain dumping everything I know about being a creator from how to get over perfectionism to how to optimize your website speed. Uh, whenever I think of something cool, I just put it on there. I've got pictures of all the sets I've ever built behind the scenes stuff. Like I'm basically just trying to build that out into like an online book of everything I've ever learned. So that might be useful to people who are watching this. Twitter, I'm Tom Frankly. And then the main channel is Thomas Frank. The Notion channel is Thomas Frank Explains. If you want to learn Notion, and I think everyone should learn Notion, I don't yeah. know, kind of biased. No, and <laughs> Thomas I, uh, Frank Explains. I, I think I personally have not got into it, but as we wanted to be more productive, that creator bundle specifically as a workflow for creators mm -hmm. in Notion, you've created that is available for purchase. Yes. You can just plug and play that right into plug Notion. Plug and play, you use it with your team. There's a whole script area, B roll areas, uh, topic and thumbnail and title optimization areas, all that kind of good stuff. Amazing. Well, I appreciate you, Thomas. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Sean. Absolutely. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Share this out. This one's a good one. Somebody needs to hear this. Smash like, depending on where you're listening to it, and we will talk soon think media podcast.